Amen. You may be seated. And as our eyes are lifted heavenward, we are reminded of how far we fall short, that in spite of God's love for us and the gift of God's love to us, we often act in destructive and hateful ways. We close our hearts to God and disobey God's law. So today I invite you to join together with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us confess our sins before Almighty God. Printed in your bulletin, together let us pray. Almighty God and loving Father, we thank you for placing us in covenant relationships in homes and families and friendships. Forgive us for taking our vows and promises lightly. Forgive us for the breakdown of family life, for misdirected love and for divorces entered lightly, for failing to give time to our families, for failing to teach and live by your values, for neglecting and abusing our children, Jesus, our heavenly brother, teach us every day to love and serve, to cherish and protect those with whom we live. In your name we pray. Amen. My friends, I want you to hear very clearly these words of assurance that come to us from the Gospel of John that Martin Luther said represent the Gospel in miniature. You know them well, I think. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order to that the world might be saved through him. Brothers and sisters, believe this good news, that in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, and go forth to live in peace. Amen. Boys and girls, I invite you to come forward at this time. And maybe today I'll let you sit on the front pews. How about we do that? Because I'm going to invite some people I want to introduce you to to come up and join me in the front right here. If you're a new member today... Come join me in the front. That's okay. I think it'll be fine. Because we want room for these folks to come up. Come on. Maybe you guys go over here so we can spread out the group in the front. Emma. Braden, all right. You guys can stay over here. Good. Well, you know, if you're here when I do a baptism, have you been here when I've done a baptism? I always say what's really cool is today on a baptismal Sunday, you get a new brother or sister when you come to church. Is that cool? Yeah? Look how many brothers and sisters you get today. Is that exciting? Yeah? Yeah, and I want you to meet your brothers and sisters today. That's good. Like, remember when I walk with the baby through the congregation? I'm not going to lift these folks up and walk with them through the congregation. But I want you to say hi to Joe over here. Can you say hi, Joe? Uh, hi. Joe, Joe is a preacher. He's done quite a bit of preaching, actually. He preaches down some in the Bronx, right? And now he's, he's doing a ministry of caring in the Bronx at a hospital where his wife works because she teaches nurses um, how to be nurses in the Bronx at Montefiore, Montefiore Hospital. So can you say hi to Debbie? Hi, Debbie. Can you say hi to Debbie? Uh, well, okay, okay. They're usually, you know, we're encouraging them. Jerry, say hi, Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Oh, one of the things I wanted to say about these guys is um, they'd really like to talk about their grandchildren. They have 10 grandchildren, and what they say is they have two more on the way. <laughs> Pretty exciting, huh? Okay, these guys have grandchildren too. Jerry, say hi, Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Jerry. And you know what Jerry said to me? He said, I'm willing to help with whatever you need at the church. Is that a good thing to say? <laughs> to a pastor? I, I'm excited about that. So that's really good. That's really good. And Marina has done about everything in the church you can do as she's been in churches in her life. And she's coming to this church now. And you know what she's doing here? 
she's working with our Kids Hope program. So she's blessing kids that are gay heads. So say hi, Marina. Hi, Marina. All right, that's good. And, and Manny, Valdivia. We've got Senesi, Senesi. Okay, Senesi and Valdivia in a Dutch Reformed church. I like that, you know? That's good, that's good. And we've got Valdivia here. And uh, he and Kate just got married like three weeks ago. Isn't that, can you say hi, Manny and Kate? Hi, Manny and Kate. Yeah, and he works on a TV show called Inside Edition. So I actually watched it the other day to see if your credits would come up. Your credits didn't come up. <laughs> so any kind of scandal in our church, he'll be filming it here, okay? So just look out for that. And Kate, she plays the oboe. It's the first time I heard her play the oboe today. Did you hear that instrument? That's an oboe, and she said the English horn. So two instruments that she played for us today. So it's awesome. She's directing our choir and sharing in music, and actually she graduated with a degree in oboe performance. So it's good that we have... I mean, you probably don't know many oboe players, do you? All right, well, now you know Kate. And then we have Scott. Say hi, Scott. He's a soccer coach. <laughs> and uh, he's been on consistory in a reformed church before, so that's exciting too. And he comes with three kids. Emma, right here. Say hi, Emma. All right, how was that, Emma? You feel welcome today? Okay, good. And Alexa? Do you feel welcome today? Good, good. And Braden? Hi, Braden. Good to have you here. And Ines, in the back, these two have met each other about a year ago. And they're going to get married. And that's very exciting. And they started looking for a church together. And um, she teaches music down in Westchester. So she's a piano player, Kate. And um, <laughs> she also speaks, she's from Brazil, so she speaks Portuguese, Spanish. She studied in France. And now she speaks English. So can you say, hi, Anise? This is the crew, and we're welcoming today. And so you're, I'm going to have you sit here, because I want you to pray for them at the end. You know how we pray for missionaries here? These guys are missionaries of our church, because we're all called into mission. So uh, they were received at the first service, but Mrs. Gilbert, I'll give you this microphone so you can formally do the elder work in this. Well, first we hear these words from Jesus. A little later on from the text we hear this morning, Matthew 25, Matthew 28, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the close of the age. Hear also these words that come from Scripture. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in all. I welcome these persons who have appeared before us and made profession of the Christian faith. We ask them now to declare that faith before God and Christ Church so that we may rejoice together and welcome them as brothers and sisters in Christ. And the, the questions we asked at the first service, the questions we ask again with gusto for those responses, I ask you first, do you renounce sin and the power of evil in your life and in the world? And this is your intention? Say it with gusto. I renounce that. I renounce that. And the one question we ask every new member of this church is, who is your Lord and Savior? And that is what binds us together in Christ. Joe, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Debbie, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Jerry, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Marina, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Manny, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And Kate, who is your Lord and Savior? And Scott, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Denise, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. I ask you, will you be a faithful member of this congregation and through worship and service seek to advance God's purposes here and throughout the world? 
If this is your intention, say, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Congregation, please rise. That's you too. Stand up. You're making promises to them today. You ready for that? Okay, do you promise to encourage and support and love these brothers and sisters in Christ by teaching the gospel of God's love, by being an example of Christian faith and character, and by giving the strong support of God's family in fellowship, prayer, and service? And what do you say to that? You going to do that? Yeah? Everybody? We do. Okay, the Lord bless you in that covenant. And I ask you, do you accept and promise to accept the spiritual guidance of the church, to walk in a spirit of Christian love with this congregation, and to seek those things that make for unity, purity, and peace? The Lord bless you in this. Together let us confess the faith of the church using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, kids, I want you to go up and make sure everybody here is touched by a hand of one of the kids from our church. Okay? Over there. Over there as well. Make sure everybody is touched by a hand. Everybody got a hand? Over there, William? Okay. Everybody got a hand? Lord, we pray for these new members now. Recognizing the call that you have for them in ministry, we celebrate all the places where you have nurtured faith in them. Pour out your Spirit upon them, Lord, that they may know your grace and your love, and they may reflect that love in everything that we do. We pray that as these young people lay hands on them, they will accept their commissioning as ministers of the gospel, reconcilers in the name of Jesus Christ, and those who are called to share that blessing in the world. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I invite you to welcome them with the words that are in the bulletin there. We say together, we celebrate your presence in this congregation. We promise you our friendship and prayers as we share hope and labor of Christ's church. Join with us as we give witness to the world. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance before you and give you peace. Welcome these new members in Christ, will you? And you can go back to Sunday school or back to your seat. Can you make it down or go out? We have the privilege of sharing our morning tithes and our offerings with God.
We give, gracious God, not because we have to. We give in response to the grace that you have shown us in Jesus Christ. And we pray that these gifts are used for your purposes, for your plans, this day and into forever. We thank you and praise you that you invite us to invest in eternity, a life lived forever with you in your presence. And we pray that these gifts share that good news. In his name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. God of grace, we are reminded that your grace calls us to reflect your glory in the way we live and the way we love. We're called to that today, Lord, as we look into the wonders of your word and are challenged by it and called forth to live faithfully. Lord, we pray that as a community of Christ, we reflect that love in this world. For we know, Lord, that our world is living through tough times right now. The world that you love so much that you gave your son so that this world might live into the plans and purpose that you have. We pray today, Lord, for all those places where that plan and that purpose seems to be being destroyed. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the situation there. That those that are at war may learn those things that make for peace. We pray for our country, especially we lift up Ferguson, Missouri this weekend. And we pray, Lord, for your guidance and your peace to be made known there and for us to understand the call to live together in love. We pray for our leaders and the decisions that are made. May they represent your grace, your love, in the ways that we are called to live together in this country. And Lord, in our own joys and concerns that we lift up, we thank you for so many joys that we share for the prayers that we've seen answered in miraculous ways and for the love that we've seen shared through prayer and support of each other. We pray for the concerns, Lord, for those who are dealing with death, for those who are dealing with sickness, for those who are dealing with emotional stress. Lord, we pray for your grace and love to be made known there and for your people to minister together in Christ's name. We thank you for the names that have been lifted up, and we recognize the names that are before us in our hearts. And we thank you for the grace that you show us in Jesus Christ and the love that we share in his name. So we pray these prayers, Lord, not in our own strength, but in the strength of the one who saves us, even Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Guide us, gracious God, through the power of your word, illumining in our hearts through the power of your spirit, the life that you call us, the love you invite us to reflect in the name of Jesus. Amen. So our journey through the parables really concludes today with this last parable that Matthew has Jesus tell us. It's a parable not included in Mark, John, or Luke. Perhaps because it's a parable that frightens us. It's a parable that may produce fear instead of God's grace in us. But I hope today you'll see the beauty of this parable and walk from this place in the love that's intended through here and through the message of Christ. So the third, remember, Jesus is talking about the end times. So the first parable was the parable of the bridegrooms. Some that didn't trust the bridegroom to return and their lamps were unlit at the time when the bridegroom came back. The parable of the talents where those who did not trust the master to live as the master called them to live buried their talents in the sand and received the judgment of the master when he came back. But those that lived into the trust of the master was returned double what they had. Today, this parable, I'm sure... Most of you have heard it before. I'm sure most of you never have forgotten the first time you heard this parable. It's a parable that on our mission folder for the Mary Marilot mission tree, it includes a verse from this parable. And it's one that I'm sure you've heard before. Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you? When was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Thanks be to God, for this is holy word. Amen. Linus, that great prophet from Peanuts, has a line that I love. That is, he shouts out in a cartoon bubble, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. I think that's an introduction to Matthew 25 today because most of us would say, we know God loves humanity. I love humanity. But it's the particular people that I can't stand. Because we all have people that we would write off our list. And here, as we come to Matthew 25, it is a text of terror because perhaps we feel like at the end of the day, there was a hungry person I passed, 
Anybody done that in this room? There was a prisoner I didn't visit. There was somebody who had no clothes that I didn't help out. If you're saying, oh, I'm pretty good on that. <laughs> you may be in bigger trouble here today. But as you read this text, let me ask you. Does it produce some terror in you? Some worry that I just haven't done enough? Steven Spielberg, two movies that uh, kind of speak to this terror. You remember Schindler's List, many of you? Schindler was that, Jew, that uh, German businessman that saved many Jews by hiding them, by buying them, by letting them escape the gas chambers of Auschwitz. And it comes to the end of the movie and Schindler is standing there and he's seen the horror of what has happened in Germany. And he says, this ring, I still have this ring. This could have bought five more people. I could have done so much more. And the movie ends with him in tears. At the tension of his life saying, I could have done so much more. Or another Spielberg movie, Saving Private Ryan. Tom Hanks, the lieutenant that goes in and gets Ryan out. And Hanks pays for it with his life. And he grabs Ryan close to his mouth at the end of his life. His last words to him are, earn this. Earn this this. And Spielberg has the start of that story beginning on the beaches of Normandy where the gravestones are and he goes up to the lieutenant's grave and he asks his daughter with tears in his eyes, I've been a good man, haven't I? I've done well. Is that the kind of terror that this text is designed to produce in us? All of us to be scared here on this day? That we haven't done enough? Is it a text that it's, as you hear the message of the gospel of grace, you say, today it seems to be turned on its head and suddenly Jesus is telling me that it's about works and not grace? It's about fear and not faith? It's about doubt in myself or belief in him? What do you think, folks? A tough text. Do you think that's why Mark and Luke and John didn't include it in their gospel? Perhaps they thought people could take it in the wrong way. But Jesus preached it. Jesus proclaimed it. And here's what I'd like to say to you today. I believe that this parable is a beautiful and graceful conclusion to the parables that Jesus has already shared. That it shows consistency with those other parables of what Jesus is trying to get across to people in understanding the life of the king. The life that we're called to live and the way we reflect that life right now, here, in this kingdom, of this world, at this time, and this day. I believe it is a beautiful parable that invites us to a deeper faith founded on a deeper relationship with the one who saves us. Because here's the things that have flown through these parables, and if you've been tracking with us at least the last three weeks, and then on beyond that in these parables, there's some themes here that come up again, and the first theme is inclusion. All right? Inclusion. That this starts with a picture of the final day when all the nations are going to come before Christ. That this is the word that's spoken in Philippians when Paul says in that great hymn of Christ that every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord on heaven, on earth, and under the earth. So Jesus says everybody is invited to this party. Remember we talked about the party of the bridegroom, the marriage feast of the Lamb. That those pieces all come together on this final day and says everybody will be there. Everybody's included in the plan, in the purpose of the one whom we call the Good Shepherd. Hold on to that right now. Because remember, we have heard Jesus say, I am 
the good shepherd. And here, as any shepherd would do, the goats and the sheep are together. And at some point in the journey, the sheep and the goats are separated. But when I talk about inclusion, what I'm talking about here is that Jesus Christ has the good of the sheep and the good of the goats in mind. You may say, preacher, you're stretching that a little too far. When we're talking about judgment, when we're talking about that place of, of being cast out, it's like, I, I don't know, anybody drive on 55 still? Uh, 55, not drive 55, I didn't say that. You were, uh, 55, is there still that sign that says eternity, smoking or non-smoking? Is it still there? Well, you can say, just give me the clue. Smoking or non-smoking? Up or down? Is that what we're talking about here? I say, first and foremost, we're talking about the good shepherd that has a design for this world that is good and gracious and loving. And trusting in faith in the plans of God in a future that is forever, in trusting that God's judgments are right and true is the invitation that we're given to here as we come to this parable. You know, sometimes I'm asked to do funerals for people that I don't know what their relationship with God was. I don't know what their relationship with Christ was. And a son or a daughter, mother, father, whatever, will ask me to do this service. And they'll say, what are you going to say about their eternal future? And I say, that's way above my pay grade. <laughs> yeah, that is in the hands of a loving God. And I trust, I trust that God so completely in the plan of this universe that I can place everything before him. The good and the bad. What was done and was left undone. And that God's purposes will be right and true in that. And then the second thing, the second thing, the second theme that have woven through these parables, besides the inclusion that everybody's invited to that party, is the response that we have to have to the first message of inclusion, which is a mystery. All right? Do you, do you hear the mystery in this text? It's beautiful. Because the ones who did well, they didn't go, yeah, oh, I nailed it. I nailed it. I got it, right? I mean, that person that was hungry, that was you. I thought so. I thought so. That person that didn't have any clothes, that was you, right? I did all that stuff. You know, I've got my checklist here. Like, I gave to beds in the name of Christ. I made sure you had a bed, Jesus, right? Is that what they did? No. They, they weren't doing it because of the reward that they were anticipating. They weren't doing it to try to check the list off and say, I did it my way. They were doing it because something had happened as they'd been captured by grace. That they moved through this world in a way that naturally saw the face of Christ, not naming Christ, but living and loving as Jesus would have them love. Not with the credentials, not with the titles, simply with the heart that had been transformed by grace. So, so you see, when I talk about the mystery, it's not our job to start deciding who are the sheep and the goats. Because we could probably have a pretty good list, right? I mean, I would imagine everybody in this room, you know, if, if I gave you paper today, and I said, you know, just line up the sheep and the goats. Who do you think are the sheep and the goats? And... Um, You'd have a list that you might produce and say, I know this person's in, I know this person's out. But one thing I know, we would probably put ourselves in the sheep category, right? Wouldn't we start at the top of the list and say, yeah, I'm doing all I can, man. I'm doing all I can. But that's not the invitation of this parable. And the invitation of this parable is to say, there's a mystery here on both sides of that coin. The sheep and the goats both say the same thing. We weren't working out our own salvation by trying to do all those things we thought we needed to do. Something else has happened to the sheep that's different than the goats. And it also ties in with the inclusion idea, to go back to that, because if you look at this text, 
there's, there's a couple things that are, are a little different in the two lines. The, the line about if you did this for the least of these in my family. That's what it says in your translation today. The New Revised Standard Version says my family. Because the New Revised Standard Version didn't want to use the more traditional brother, brothers or brethren. Um, because sisterin doesn't sound as good and they're trying the non-sextist thing, you know, so, so they don't put brothers and sisters or brethren and sisterin. They put family. And some of the commentators I read, and if you want to go this way, you can, said really what Jesus is saying is, is he's saying if you do good to those in the church, those in my family, those who I recognize. So, so you can kind of recall a works righteousness with that, right? You say, well, if we make sure there's nobody in the church that's poor, if there's nobody in the church that doesn't have clothes, if there's nobody in the church that's in prison that doesn't get, you know, that's what we have to worry on, the church. In fact, some commentators, and I'm not sure how they get to this point, but they say it's actually a call to care for missionaries, all right? So if you care for the missionaries, you're really doing this work of, of caring for those that are the least of these, my family, because missionaries would kind of be the ones that are living out there on the end without much uh, financial help. Do you like that? I kind of like that. I kind of like that because then you can bring it back to my works, my righteousness, what I can do. I can check off that list and we could do a pretty good job, right? Of making sure that nobody in this church is poor. We can, we can do a pretty good job of saying, let's just make sure that this family is okay. But the reason I don't believe you can go that way in the translation is because when he speaks to the goats, what does he say? He says, if you've done this, to the least of these. Now, one commentator I read said Jesus was just using an economy of language there. So he didn't put, um, you know, the family or the brothers in again. Jesus just left that one kind of open. I believe that Jesus is saying this. That God's family, those that are created in the image of God, is everyone. Is everyone. And if you look at the Gospels, that's very clear. For God so loved the cosmos, the world. And we can talk about some of the theological commentaries that try, might try to negotiate around that one. But what I want you to know today, without a shadow of a doubt, that no matter who you pass on the roads out there, who you pass in the streets, in the grocery store, you cannot lock eyes on someone that God does not love. You cannot lock eyes on somebody that is not a part of those that are created in the image of God. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. So he leaves no room for us to interpret this text as a works righteousness that we just have to do more and more and more. I think he is driving much, down, deep, much deeper down into our soul. And that's why I believe that all these parables are parables first and foremost about faith. About whether you trust that he is the one in whom all things hold together, as Colossians tells us. He is the one who comes as king to judge this earth. He is the one in whom I trust. And finally, he is the one in whom this relationship is founded. Because ultimately, that's the test that comes. Those that were walking as the sheep amongst the good shepherd, unbeknownst to them, recognize that they are in relationship with Christ, even in the faces that they didn't recognize Christ in. That they are in him whom they live and breathe and have their being. And that's the beauty. That's the beauty of what these parables convey to us that ultimately is about that relationship that ties us together in Christ. So finally, the thing I want you to understand about all these parables of the kingdom is this, these are not stories that Jesus is telling us so that we can be sure that we have the right life insurance policy when it comes to the end of the day and when the fires of hell are there, we make sure that we can cash in our policy and say, I'm headed to that place I was created for. Because you notice that, that Jesus said, you were created. You were created 
before the foundation of time to be received into that kingdom of heaven. That's what God designed you for. That's what God designed this earth for. That's what God designed every human being for. What does he say about the other place? Who was that designed for? He doesn't say that was designed for anybody except the devil and his angels. That's not the place that God designed for you. God made you to be heavenly beings, sharing in that joy this day and always. But the invitation is to share in that joy right now. And that's the powerful message of this parable. That there's a way to live and walk on this earth that reflects the kingdom of heaven, not someday far away, but right now, here in this place. And those that are the sheep reflect that in the way they are living today, not simply on the final day of judgment. A new book out by Nicholas Kristof, A Path Through, talks about the power of giving and the power of giving in the way the world is being transformed by some strategic ways that people are giving. And one of the chapters in the book, it's interesting, talks about the goodness of giving for our bodies. All right? You want low blood pressure? Give money. You want emotional health? Give money. I'm serious. That's one of the chapters. He says, physically, physiologically, neuroscience has discovered that people that give are much healthier in the way they live. Okay, you can do two things with that. You can make it a works righteousness program and say, I'm going to give so my blood pressure will go down. But I don't think... That's what this is about. I think Christoph is pointing to the deeper truth of the Christian faith that as our lives are tied together with Christ, as we understand that, that living in this world is not about how much I can get, but how much I can give in love reflected in Christ, that we tap into something much deeper. Yes, in neuroscience and physiology, it's true. But in the spiritual realm that God is talking about us, that's what, that's what causes us to see life lived in a different way. No, this is not a parable about works righteousness. This is a parable about God's grace and how when that grace takes hold of us, we see the world and we live our lives in different ways. That's reflective. That's reflective of these parables coming to be a part of our life. So, I've got something for you to do today after I talked about what God has done. This is my homework assignment for you. I want you to um, go to the mall or go to the Best, Best Buy on Friday, Black Friday, all right? <laughs> Get there early, like when those crazy people that have been camped out, like that guy in front of Best Buy, you know, he was on the front page of the Times yesterday. Since November 11th, he's been camped out to be in the front of the line at Best Buy. And I want you to stand in the middle of the store or the middle of the mall and I just want you to say, everybody, I love you. All right? And see if you feel that in that moment. If you can see with the eyes of Christ that everybody who walks through those doors that's bashing and fighting to get to the little screen TV or that big screen TV, that all those are people whom God loves. The least and the lost, the sad sack that has to have that TV. God loves them and our eyes should see with that love of Christ in whatever situation we're in. Or the tendency for us in those moments is to be more like the goats. And to say, really God? You love that person, and that one, and that one, and that one. But more and more, as our lives are captured by grace, and that infuses everything who we are, without thinking about it, the love that we show is a love that we would show Christ. And the love that we give is an investment in eternity that God says is what you were designed for from the foundation of the world. I love 
humanity. I love people, too. Let us pray. God, let us come to this parable as a parable of beauty, a parable of faith, of belief, of trust in you, that you are working good things for this world and working good things on our lives in ways that we might not fully understand, but in ways that as they capture our hearts are reflected in the way that we live. Let everyone in this place walk from here, one, knowing how much they are loved by you, and two, knowing how much you love everyone they are passing by this day. I pray this in the name of Jesus, the King of the kingdom. Amen. Let us stand and sing together hymn number 700, We Are God's People. Amen.